and tells us, you are not children but men. You can behave like men. And if you do not, I shall require it of you. Can the desire of the body be good? Was it not created by God? Is it not the movement of the fountain of life? I have written a book about the holiness of sexual desire. Moses ben Nachman, you are a lewd rabbi. Lewd? You talk like a Christian. All the holy earth is filth to him, so he wallows in filth and trembles with guilt. A king should take his pleasures like a lion. Our King David had 18 wives and concubines, and that was considered no sin. Only his adultery with Bathsheba, who was a married woman. You are no help to me, Rabbi, no help at all. You are either too evil or too good for me. Eighteen wives, and this was your Messiah. Rather different from our Jesus. I should have been a king before Jesus came. And now let us address ourselves to the highest authority on this subject, the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let us consider two Jews, the Pharisee and the tax gatherer, standing side by side in prayer. And the Pharisee said as he prayed, Thank God I am not as other men are. But the tax gatherer smote himself upon the breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Christ tells us that the sinner, not the Pharisee, was justified in the eyes of God. The humble sinner, the arrogant Jew. He who looks into his own heart and is appalled by the corruption he finds there knows that without a savior he is lost. Poised between heaven and hell, the pit at our feet, we stretch our arms out to our Savior who draws us from the brink of destruction. But the Jew says the Messiah is only a man and does not bring salvation. He says they do not need salvation because of their learning and their practice of the law which they call the Torah. I say this is arrogance and complacency to look into the abyss and be appalled. That is the beginning of wisdom. And the Jews, for all their superficial cleverness, do not have this wisdom. Their religion is for a scholarly elite. It doesn't answer to the needs in the heart of every man, the high and the low, the righteous and the sinner, the scholar and the layman. That is why Christ Church gains new converts every day. That is why it will conquer the world. Do not think yourself, Rabbi, a great and learned man above the common herd. Look into the abyss. Think yourself a human being like other human beings. Humble yourself. Ask of God, be merciful to me, a sinner. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, sent from heaven, who for our sins died upon the cross, the divine Messiah. I pray that with God's help, I may have touched the heart of the Jew. Complacent, self-satisfied, superficial. These are heavy charges. To acknowledge one's own sinfulness is certainly a great thing. But shall we call ourselves utterly worthless? Were we not created in the image of God? And is it not an insult to God to call ourselves worthless? Self-criticism is good. And where can you find more examples of this than in our Jewish writings? What other nation has put on record in its sacred book every backsliding, every weakness, every sin and disloyalty of which it has been guilty? The sins of the Jews are recorded there, and our enemies are not slow to use this record against us. But blessed is the nation that is not afraid to give such a handful to its enemies. But let us consider what is the aim and purpose of humility and self-criticism. Is it not to learn from one's errors and do better in the future? But if we carry humility to such a point that one says, 
I am utterly worthless, no action of mine can ever be good, then the incentive to improvement has been abolished and excessive humility becomes an excuse for lack of effort. This is what you Christians do. You ask God to take you over. You give up the task for which he put you into the world like a child who refuses to walk. And then a worse result comes about. You fancy that God has taken you over, that your Savior has snatched you from the abyss into a state of sinlessness in which you can do nothing wrong. From a state of abject humility, you emerge into a state of incredible arrogance and proclaim that you are saved and that God is now speaking through your mouth. But we Jews know that no man on this earth is ever without sin. Not Moses, not even the Messiah. We must grapple with the evil instinct from the first day of our lives to the last. Is this our complacency? Is this self-righteousness? We Jews, you say, are proud and an elite because we reckon ourselves the chosen people of God. But for what were we chosen? To show all nations an example of a people who is not afraid to stand upright on the earth. To regard no man as God. To look even God in the face and not be overwhelmed. This is why we are the chosen people of God. For God does not want us human beings to be wretches and cowards who dare not stand on our own feet. And this is what makes us hated by all the nations on earth who reckon that we are endangering their lifestyles, their saviors and demigods who save them from the effort of living like men. We are proud, yes, but we want all men to be proud. We were chosen, yes, but for what? for power, for happiness, for rest and security in our possessions? No, for pain and misery and persecution and wandering over the face of the earth. Do not say that we have not seen the abyss. We who are on the brink of it every day of our lives. We who began our journey by crossing the desert with only the pillar of fire to guide us, we have seen it. Yet we continue our journey by the guidance of God's law, which was given for men, not for angels or devils. Moses, who delivered the law to us, gave us also a say when he stood before his death on the border of the promised land. Be strong and of good courage. It's strange. What's strange? You have treated the Jew with quite unnecessary favor. In my opinion, the Jew won the disputation with a great many points to spare. Why don't you become a Jew then, since you found his arguments so convincing? Don't be ridiculous, Yolanda. One doesn't change one's religion on the basis of a few days of verbal fencing. Besides, it was a pleasure to see somebody fighting with words instead of with a broadsword. Not everyone took the view that the Jew had the best of it but you actually rewarded him. Just a few gold coins. 300 gold crowns. What prompted such a magnanimous gesture? Respect. I have seldom seen so unjust a cause so skillfully argued. He may have cause to regret his free and easy manner of arguing on holy topics. Yolanda. I warn you, Yolanda, do not plot against a rabbi. Plot against him? Is there no need to plot against him? And what about you, James? You may be reconciled with the church, but you still have to put your own house in order. Well, Oh, I was just thinking of something the rabbi said to me about King David. My Consuelo, how long will they let me keep you? I must give you up. Some things even you can't fight against, James. Death, damnation, the church, and my wife, especially my wife. 
What did you think of the result of the disputation? It was a great occasion. I do think things would have been better left as they were. Things haven't changed very much. Many things will change now. Rabbi Moses has to go into exile. I mean, how long before all the other Jews have to go? It's all this idea of bringing on the Day of Judgment. Doing without the devil. Just leave the world as it is, James. Nothing stays as it is, Consuelo. Nothing will ever be the same again. Oh, please don't forget me, James. Try to keep them from getting rid of the Jews. What would the world be like without the Jews? Majesty. Rabbi Moses, I sent for you because I feel I owe you an explanation. You understand, of course, that I have saved you from death. I realize that, Your Majesty, and I'm grateful. You should never have written that book about the disputation. The Pope is very particular about books. I was forced to write it because of the misrepresentations that were circulating. I know. I wrote nothing in the book that I had not said with your full permission during the disputation. I know that too. If it had been up to me, you would not have been exiled, but I got into very hot water with the Pope, and the next communication would be awkward. I appreciate that, Your Majesty. Do you feel that I have let you down, Rabbi Moses? I appreciate that you played the game according to the rules, Your Majesty. I'm glad you see that. Where will you go? I understand King Alfonso of Castile is very tolerant towards Jews. I am an old man, Your Majesty. I had expected to die here in Aragon, surrounded by my family, but God had other plans for me. In a way, I'm glad. I should like to die in the Holy Land, the land of my fathers. It's a long way to travel. We Jews are used to traveling. Yes. And what will you do there? There is much to do. The study of the law has been neglected there. I shall build an academy and work for the revival of learning in Jerusalem. The land has too few Jews in it now. We must build a strong settlement in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. But can you do all this on your own? There is another scholar who will help, Rabbi Yechiel of Paris. He too was exiled after a disputation. You should be happy, Your Majesty. Your Christian disputations are helping to revive the Jewish settlement in the land of Israel. Well, that wasn't quite my intention, Rabbi, but I'm glad you accepted in that spirit. How will you live? By my profession. As a rabbi? That is not a profession. I am a physician. A physician? Well, well. I wonder if... Uh, No, it's, uh, it's not important. Is there anything that I can do for you, Rabbi Moses? All I ask is that no other Jew should suffer from the disputation. You have my promise on that. You are a good man. But do not become too much of a Christian. Keep some of the pagan in you. It's a pity in a sense that we Jews gave you pagans a sense of sin. You don't know what to do with it. I will not argue theology with you, Rabbi. I wish you a safe journey to the Holy Land. And I'm very sorry to see you go. Believe me. Goodbye. Uh, one moment. Silence.
Give me your blessing. 